in the prophet. Mentioning the prophets calls their prophecies to mind and intimates that all such prophecies about Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, to which the law looked forward, have now been completely fulfilled. And we know for certain from Christ's own words and from later scripture that the old prophets of renown would not be making the same mistake which the present believers in Jerusalem were making. For they had eagerly looked forward to the fulfillment of the things they were given to prophecy. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Matthew 13.17 For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see, and have not seen it, and to hear what you hear, and have not heard it. Luke 10.24 Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it, and was glad. John 8.56 Even as they foretold this salvation that was to come to you, the prophets of old diligently investigated and inquired about this gift of grace, being eager to discover the precise time the Spirit of Christ within them was signifying as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories of salvation, among other things that would follow the cross. For it was revealed to them that in prophesying these things, they were not so much serving themselves as they were you, and these same things have now been proclaimed to you through those who gave you the gospel through the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven. Even angels want to look into these things. 1 Peter 1, 10-12 through 12. By the time this letter was read in Jerusalem, the New Testament was at least halfway towards completion, so that these believers could not use the excuse of being entirely dependent upon the Old Testament for their faith and practice not to mention that they had uniquely been blessed to have the teachings of the apostles to a degree not experienced by any other church. Certainly, the entire Bible is a blessing, and all of it is useful for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, 2 Timothy 3.16, and the law in particular is useful for those who use it properly, 1 Timothy 1.8. Then he said to them, Therefore every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Matthew 13.52 For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Romans 15.4 but by emphasizing God the Father's prior communication of the truth to the past generations through the prophets and contrasting this prior method in the previous dispensation to the Son, who is now the Father's preferred means of dispensing his truth, Paul uses the word of God in the Spirit, like a sharp sword, to divide the backward-looking wrong approach of these believers from the forward-looking correct approach to which he is attempting to call them back. There are only two options to stand with the word or to go one's own way instead. Any attention to the actual scriptures would demonstrate that Jesus is now the true focus of all we have and do as believers. And I fell before his feet to worship him. And he said to me, See that you don't do that. I am a fellow servant of you and of your brothers who hold fast the testimony about Jesus. Worship God! For the testimony about Jesus is the essence, literally spirit, of all divine prophecy. Revelation 19.10 Verse 2 But now in these last days the Father has communicated to us in a Son, the one whom he has appointed heir of all things, the one through whom he created the universe, that is, time and space. Hebrews 1.2 Now this is a fair addition to any English translation in order to bring out with emphasis what is obvious from reading this verse in the Greek, namely the vivid split between the previous situation under the Old Testament and the present regime of the Father's communication to his people at the present time in a son. Previously, many prophets and many other media were employed by the Father to lead up to the central event of all human history, the birth, ministry, sacrifice, and resurrection of the Son of God. After the cross and our Lord Jesus is rising from the dead, and after the gift of the Holy Spirit, everything has changed. That is, in its essence, the theme of Hebrews and the basis for everything Paul has to say in this epistle. 
The dispensation of the Spirit with his anointing and indwelling of all believers, with his gifting and empowering of unique spiritual gifts never before given, and with his, at that time, imminent completion of the canon of the New Testament, wherein all of the prior mysteries are fully revealed, is so different from what went before that now, in these last days turning backwards to the old, would not only result in a myopic view of the truth at best, but was also extremely spiritually dangerous. To overlook the revelations of the new, and to fail to take advantage of the Spirit's explication and empowerment of them. In these last days, in contrasting the present day to the previous days gone by, the time of the first advent being the great dividing line, Paul's words here, these last days, are referring to the present dispensation of the church age, the final dispensation before the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we have studied previously, the dispensations, that is, the Father's dividing up of human history in terms of how he has chosen to dispense his truth, are as follows. Number 1. Gentile Patriarchy from Adam to Abraham, mainly through individual believers. Number 2. Jewish Patriarchy, from Abraham to Moses, mainly through Jewish patriarchs. Number 3. The Mosaic Law, from Moses to Christ, mainly through the prophets, the Levites, and the written word of the Old Testament, the Law, the prophets, and the writings. Number 4. The Church, from Christ's first advent to his second advent, initially through apostles and other specially gifted men, then to all believers in the Spirit through the completed canon and the teaching of pastor teachers from it. Number 5. The Millennium, from Christ's return to the end of history, unlimited truth available from multiple sources, Isaiah 11, 9 and Habakkuk 2.14. This is not meant to be a complete description of the dispensational differences, which we have covered previously but does give the gist of the main differences in the many means and ways the Father has employed to dispense His truth to the world before our Lord's coming. It is important to add first that between the law and the church, during our Lord's three-and-a-half-year ministry, He who is the living Word of God was the main source of truth for all truly interested in it, for His life, His ministry, and His sacrifice are, as we have noted, the great dividing line of human history as God has constructed it. Secondly, while the church age began with the giving of many unique spiritual gifts, such as apostleship, prophecy, and tongues to aid in the expansion of Christ's assembly beyond Israel to the Gentile world at large, these were never meant to be permanent, and indeed the Spirit ceased giving these sign gifts as soon as the Bible was completed or perfected with the completion of the canon. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 11. From that point forward, circa 68 AD, with the penning of Revelation and the death of the Apostle John, the Bible, the universal indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the teaching ministry of prepared, gifted, and qualified pastor teachers, are the means that the Father has employed to dispense his truth, the ritual following of the law no longer being valid. Thirdly, it should also be noted that the third dispensation, that of Israel under the law, still has seven years to run, the time of the tribulation. This last seven years before our Lord's return will run concurrently with the last seven years of the church age, with the result that the last two dispensations prior to Christ's return will join into one on the eve of that return during the tribulation. What concerns us here in our present study is that the situation for the believers in Jerusalem at the time of writing was, in terms of the way the Father is dispensing his truth to the world, mostly the same as what we find today, the only exception being that there were still apostles, such as Paul, with divinely given authority over the entire church. It is also possible that some other special communication gifts were still being given, but Paul talks about these in the past tense at Hebrews 2, for in the context of having to remind these believers about the not-too-distant past. What we can say with authority is that the dispensation of the law was by this time distantly and definitively over from God's point of view, the fact of the temple still being in place and the rites and rituals of the law still being carried out for the moment notwithstanding.
Thus, with the phrase, in these last days, Paul draws a sharp line of demarcation between the present reality of a new dispensation empowered by the Spirit and the old one of the law, whose true purpose had now been entirely fulfilled by the coming sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ.